surgery superhuman And I know that the answers are inside Yeah, I am a 21st century superhuman Now, now, now is the time Come, come Come on everyone, let's celebrate We are the children of the sun I can see it when I look into your eyes We are the same, and we are light, and yeah, we are one Hear now, hear my ancient prayer and sing along We are awakening as one we can make a difference Yeah, we can be the change it takes To make the world a lot more fun But if you're feeling kinda down And you need some inspiration To remember who you are Oh, now, child, please don't frown You can choose a new vibration And these words can take you far First century superhuman. Hello, welcome to another exciting episode of Bridge to Paradise, the feature show. And today we have one of our favorite super friends with us. Um, we have the founder and I mean, he probably wouldn't like to call himself a leader, but he is the leader of Evolved Ministry. Um, which is one of our favorite energy schools because they focus on love, which if you're following us, you know, is one of our favorite topics. So, um, Carrie, do you want to introduce our guests? Well, I would love to catch the ball from you and introduce him a little bit, and then we'll get Ken to introduce him more because they're really great compadres. Um, yeah, I mean, God, where do we start? You know? <laughs> I just want to say, you know, here we are, we're talking about 21st century superhuman, and this is the bridge to paradise, the bridge to the new earth. So we are in the process of waking up to who we truly are. We're in the, you know, for thousands of years, our superpowers have been suppressed and we literally are superhumans. We literally have these capabilities that have been suppressed by superstition, you know, and the overbearing religious doctrines and all these things that didn't want the slave species to be too smart. Because if we were too smart, we'd figure it out and get the world going the right direction. So that's what we're doing now. And um, I think there are many, many people who are waking up, especially younger generations, but really all generations are starting to wake up to these abilities that we have, a lot of individuals. And so Michael Grubb happened to jump into this dimension and, um, and founded Evolved Ministry and Evolved University so that he could, because he happened to come in with a lot of these skills awakened, and he can tell us his story about that. And, um, and so what he's doing is teaching people to access these abilities, or a lot of people who are waking up to the abilities are going to him and going, hey, man, what do I do with this, you know, and how do I, how do I activate it more, and what do I do with it? And um, so my meeting of Ken this past summer, um, randomly, because <laughs> he messaged me on Facebook, our great meeting place of this global community right now. I mean, what a what a cool tool we have just in being able to be connected with each other worldwide. And, um, and, and I started seeing Ken's videos on telekinesis and activating the wind and all this stuff. And then, um, and the, and, and so I started reposting his videos. And then, he po he messaged me and he was like, he saw me with like, oh, 21st century superhuman. So he messaged me and he said, hey, I'm in the town right next door to you. We should get together. And I was thinking, oh man, I don't want to get together with somebody I haven't met on Facebook, but I called all my posse up and I said, hey, you guys, this is the guy that can move the wind through the trees. Do you want to go, do you want to meet him? And so we all met, went and met him at a park and he immediately started teaching us how to do it too. And so that is what is so cool and exciting is that these guys have accessed their superpowers, we'll call it that, and we like to call them Jedis, although they don't like us to call them that. Uh, but just to say, 
you know, this is something all of us can access, but I worked with Tony Robbins for many years, put him on stage in Cobo Hall and different places in the Midwest in the early 80s doing firewalks and did a bunch of firewalks with him and broke boards with my bare hands and all of that. And Tony used to say, when you duplicate the physiology and the mental syntax of someone who has already developed the skill to do something supernatural, so to speak, um, you can access the same part of your brain instantly. And it's why people sit at the feet of masters. It's why we do, so it's actually a science called modeling where we get around someone who's already tapped into a skill and we then are able to do that thing ourselves quicker. So um, anyway, Ken, why don't you go ahead and do an intro for Mike, because you can probably do it better than I can, but that's kind of an intro to us being here together in this process and what we're looking at as 21st century superhuman skills. From my book, 21st Century Superhuman, which is available on Amazon, and our website, 21stcenturysuperhuman.com, in construction right now, but a lot of cool stuff coming soon. So go ahead, my friend. Well, Mike is uh, one of my good friends and and brothers. Um, I would consider him like part of my soul family for sure. Um, he's an excellent guy based in love. I mean, that's the the purest and simple you know way to put it. Um, and his techniques are profound. So um, that's all. Further ado, I'd like to introduce Michael Grubb. Well, hello everyone. Um, so obviously there's going to be some some questions about how I came across all this. and Yeah, I is. think that would be great. If you would just share with us kind of your awakening process and your history a little bit and how you got to where you are now, I think that'd be really good for people to hear. Okay. Well, let me make sure this is in front here. Um, what really happened, you know, at uh, it started off in early childhood um, and my mother knew that I was prone to certain things, but most of the stuff that I was prone, she was, she was actually bringing me up in the Christian religion at that time. Okay. So I was African American Methodist Episcopal. And so you're talking like a strict religion. It's not as strict to say like the Pentecostals, but it's pretty strict. And it was, to her, when she saw all these abilities developing, it was okay that I was using them for the Christian religion because then, you know, you can say that I was a healer or they could say that I was this or they could say that I was that. But eventually, you know, what happened was is, of course, uh, what ended up working with me was not the Christian religion. You know, the entire time that I was growing up, I had a big question mark over my head as to and, why. And as we've, said, as we've said before, Ken grew up similarly to you. So we've said that, we've shared that on the show before. And so it's kind of a neat history yeah. you guys have. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of parallels there. And I noticed that a lot of people who have come across this, and given the fact that we are in America, and I do live in the Bible Belt, more than likely, you know, we're going to come across some pretty heavy uh, Christian religion. One second. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so... I was brought up that way, but um, what ended up started happening was, is as a child, I was having all sorts of experiences. It's kind of difficult to really put a name or a label on it. We'll just say that uh, there was a lot of, you could call quote unquote spiritual energies. I don't even really typically like to use the term spirituality anymore because I believe that we are just what we are. And so when I use the term spiritual, it almost sounds generic to me anymore, but I was experiencing a whole lot of... Um, let's just say as a child upgrades that I didn't know what to do with. And so, so when, so when you say an upgrade, how did that happen? Um, I would say, okay, I'll tell you a brief story. I used to have what was known as imaginary friend, what we all call an imaginary friend. Okay. Um, except mine was a little bit more physical, <laughs> maybe say so than others. I, I actually, I couldn't tell whether or not someone else's imaginary friend had any more physicality than mine. So that's whatever. Anyway, but I had this, this, uh, friend named Buck. He, I, to my eyes, he was about a eight, nine foot tall gorilla. That's what I saw, but it spoke English. And my mother would always see me out in the yard talking and playing with this particular entity. But of course she's seen me run around circles and speaking into thin air. doesn't know, you know, 
And so one day she, you know, she called me in from outside. Now this whole imaginary uh, friend thing went on for about a couple of years. Okay. And so she called me inside and she asked me, she said, who are you talking to out there? And of course I said, Buck. Okay. And she knew who Buck was. She's heard it a million times. And she finally just decides to tell me on this particular day, you do know that Buck's an imaginary person, right? Oh, yeah, that's she decided to finally pull it. You know, the whole Santa Claus routine, you know, Santa Claus isn't actually real. And so I sat there and looked at her. I was like, I was like, no, he, he's, he's right out there. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm positive of it. And the funny thing was, so I go back outside and I talk to Buck and I'm like, my mom says, you're not even there. And she, and Buck tells me to tell her this, uh, really tell her that nine o'clock at night tonight that I'll be here to visit the house. And so, of course, I was excited. I went back inside and I said, mom, guess what? Buck's going to come and introduce himself to you. Nine o'clock tonight is basically like that. And my mom and my sister both started laughing hysterically. And my sister, who loved to taunt me, I mean, she really, she stuck it there on me, you know. And, and so I remember that entire day being excited. And then right coming up to around seven or eight o'clock or whatever, um, I started reminding my mom. And then at that point, she said, OK, that's enough. It's time for you to go to bed. And so she puts me to bed. Um, I'm, of course, wanting to stay up for Buck. I probably fought it for about 10 or 15 minutes. I don't know. I end up passing out just like any kid would. Well, years later, my mother tells me the story of what really happened that night. What really happened that night. I didn't hear it the next day, but I hear it years later. So I remember asking my mom. I was like, you remember that imaginary friend that I had named Buck? And then mom was like, yeah. And she said, uh, something happened with that, by the way. And she said, do you remember the day that you told me that Buck was coming up? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, that night, they, I was asleep. And they were downstairs. They were watching television. My dad is out of town because he's off on a business trip. He used to work for the Naval Weapons Support Center Crane. And he did a lot of building weapons. So anyway, <clears throat> he was out on a business trip. Nine o'clock rolls around. There's a knock at the door. Doom, 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 doom. My sister looks at my mom. She gets up. She goes to the door. She looks out through the peephole. Nothing there. Slightly. I don't think she really opened. From what my mom told me, she was like, she kind of slightly looked out the window or tried to maybe open the door. I can't remember exactly what it was, but nothing was there. So she went and sat back down and then they were uh, watching television. And then the knock came again. And at that point, mom and Teresa ran upstairs, shut off all the lights, got into her back bedroom, and then they just stayed there. They didn't come back out. Needless to say, they didn't see Buck. It didn't, you know, there was no intermixing and nothing really happened, but it freaked them out enough to where my mom kept that in her memory. And then she'd finally tell me about like the results of what actually happened years later. And it was right at nine o'clock on the nose. That reminds me of the you can't handle the truth line because imagine if they had seen Buck, if they freaked out that bad just from him knocking. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. So that was exactly. So that was the whole thing. It was like uh, my mom knew that there was a whole lot more to what was going on with me back then. But like I said, she, I think that she really thought that she was going to use it more in a Christian perspective. You know what I mean? And so what ended up happening is, you know, like I said, um, I'd there love were, to see the Christian spin on an eight foot gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> talking, talking gorilla. Yeah, that was, uh, that was something else. And so, but it, you know, what's really odd is right after that experience, I don't remember much having any more experiences with Buck period. I didn't have any more imaginary, you know, there was no more interaction after that date. And so that was kind of strange too. I, you know, thinking about that now and just looking back on it, it's like, it just ended. It just out of nowhere just ended. Um, and so I was having all these experiences happen and I would tell my mom what really got it, what the big, I would call the big uh, moment for me was when, uh, this is hard for me to explain because of so many circumstances that went around this. My mother had a situation uh, back with the church sometime. It was like, I think I was about seven or eight years old at the time. And there was this one particular area of the church that I was always really frightened of as a kid. And it was the sub basement. And this is where my mom really realized that I was tapped into something. But 
at first she kind of fought it. And I told her, I was like, there's this area, there's this part of the church. I don't even like going into the church. I would tell my mom that because every time I would go into the church, I would begin to feel it immediately. And the sub kills with you just telling about it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a very, this is a very strange situation. It truly was. Um, and what I would do is every time I would walk into the church, I would get the feeling and something would always lead me to the door to that, to that uh, sub basement, but I would never open the door to go behind it. Just wouldn't do it. Um, and then I started having really. No, I used to have dreams about something like that when I was a kid. Repeated, uh -huh. repeated, repeated dreams of this basement that I did not like to go into because I knew there was weird energy down there. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, same thing with me and same thing with this church. And I finally, like I said, I told my mom about it told her I didn't want to go to the church because I felt weird there, told her that I thought that there was something evil in the sub basement, but I also could feel it within the environment. So I knew that the concentration of it was in the sub basement, but I knew that it was also everywhere. So I told her religiously, I don't want to go there. I'm tired of it. It's, it's scary to me. Well, anyway, I kept pointing to this this sub basement of the church, this one door. Well, one day there was a woman who came to the church who was actually a quote unquote exorcist. Okay. And this person came from Indianapolis and what she was doing, she was just coming down there to visit this particular church because African-American churches, whether you're they're Baptist or Methodist, they all pretty much work in cohesion with one another, some way, shape, form, or another. Well, this woman came down and she was also a preacher. She walked into the door, uh, the basement area, and immediately contacted my mom because my mom was a trustee at that time, right? And then they contacted the minister of the church. They all got together and she said, you have a massive problem centered in the basement of your church, in the sub-basement. And so they ended up doing a for real exorcism that night where my mother had to sit in on it and see what was going on. Apparently, wow. voice, exactly. Voices came out of thin air that they couldn't explain. Now, I wasn't there, so I don't know. The other thing was, is one of the reverends that were there became extremely fearful. And I guess he tried to run. And then all of a sudden, his voice changed. And then they had to tackle him down and then exercise him, too. So they had this situation that was jumping from point to point to point. But it was all in one night. And then finally, the, exor the woman the exorcist, uh, whoever, whatever she did, she got it out. Because the next time my mother took me into the church, there was nothing there. But it only took about a year later, and it came right back. The problem is, is there was a lot of hip hypocrisy going on in the church. And if you have a whole lot of hypocrisy going on in one centered place, that opens the doorway for anything to walk in. Well, <clears throat> oh, go ahead. You're about ready in, to say something. In the battleground between darkness and light over thousands of years on planet earth. And as we talk about in 21st century superhuman, and I know you do at Evolve Ministry and Ken reiterates, um, when, we, when we stray from unconditional love and we begin going into blame, judgment, fear, hostility, and control, we begin structuring these realities of darkness. And this is a very interesting dynamic that many are becoming aware of today. And I know people who are, you know, they go into other dimensions to help shift this balance between darkness and light. But what's so exciting is those on the front lines on the planet right now being awake, and I know it's in the millions at this point, are getting that being aligned with love is the only way we're going to change things. You and got it. So that's such a cool um story that you have and um yeah go ahead and then tell us how that leads into your awakening to your abilities you're playing with now well um these are all things like i didn't really get a chance to to hone it obviously as a child because what i would do is i would just go out and do stuff and then it would happen but it wasn't like i was practicing it as a anything you know it was just something that as a child Obviously, my light was open and it was open to receiving a lot of uh, uh, frequencies and I would just pick up on it. Well, by the time I got to my teenage years, though, like. Let's just pause know. for one second, Mike. He say, so, Ken, you've got a couple of kids and they just tap into their energies pretty naturally, don't they? Yeah, really, without even trying, they uh, they can go out there and connect. You can see how they play and how the movements mimic how they play or you know i'll even just tell my son you know go ahead and you know play with the wind or and he'll just put his arms up and flap his hands around and it will just flush out <laughs> you know it's uh 
they have a, a natural ability to do it. I'd, I'd love to see them actually. I've, I've messed with the pinwheels a little bit, the side wheel, but um, I'd like to see what they do under like a glass container. <laughs> it won't be long. You know, really, and I think for people that have kids to realize that children are more in touch with these natural abilities that we have and to encourage them um, and give them opportunities to kind of play with what's naturally coming up for them. And we'll understand this a little more as we go, get, go through this show. Well, and as we educate the adults, we're going to help the adults help the children understand what's going on with them, because what's happening is they're just coming out with a higher default frequency. Like it used to be the exception rather than the norm. Um, I had similar experiences and because I didn't know how to frame them or have a point of relativity in my head, I got kind of narcissistic as a child about it. Like I was special or something. Um, and I have to tell you, every church I ever walked into, I felt uneasy about and, and felt that whole weird, uh, like the inauthentic and dangerous yep. energy. And that's what the whole religious construct is created for, is to um, ha facilitate a sort of catalyst for those lower vibrating energies to find carriers, essentially. You got it to, you know, put forth the dark agenda. And so, yeah, it's a frequency thing. And anytime I have somebody coming to me saying, you know, I have a dark energy around me or following me or a demon is trying to haunt me or possess me or whatever, my advice is always the same. Focus on raising your frequency. Wow. Um, because if it doesn't match, they can't mess with you. That's why Michael would get taken to the door and would never go through it. I had ghost experiences as a child, but they never frightened me um, because I always just knew my power. I knew they couldn't touch me. I knew that that had something to do with me and how empowered I was just instinctively knew that as a child. Absolutely. You know what? This is crazy. As we're talking about this, the basement that I had repeated dreams about my entire childhood and I did not want to go down there and it seemed really dark and scary to me was at my aunt and uncle's house. And my cousin who grew up in that house has had almost a lifelong, seriously debilitating illness, um, chronic, mm. really, 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 really serious. I mean, to the point where she, you know, can barely function. That interesting. Is interesting. I just started like putting those two pieces together and it might be interesting to just do some prayers around releasing those energy fields. Absolutely. At a distance, you know. Absolutely. I mean, sometimes those things are there because of like like I was saying before, people's own preferences when you have so many hypocrisies that are going on within the church and for uh, for me that was what was going on there were so many hypocrisies going on in the church that it was just facilitating that negative behavior if you have people that are doing negative things it opens up doorways for negative frequencies to operate that's it it's simple mathematics really um so yeah it's incredible what can happen as a matter of fact we can even jump Fast forward real quick. Let's go to when Ken booked coming out to Bloomington, Indiana, the first time I had ever met Ken. Okay. And so this is now Ken had no idea uh, what was going on when he first came to Bloomington, Indiana. And he had a situation where he was already dealing with the person that I dealt with in the past in terms of my previous employment. So there were some interesting things that were going on in terms of positive and negative but when ken comes out so we go and ahead mike mike let me just jump in in here to say we've because we've talked about this history on the show before uh -huh. shows, um, that ken had just gone through kind of a pretty intense wake-up process right he did ken, yeah right at this time when you first went to mike's yep yep yeah yeah for sure it was um <clears throat> i think within a, a few months of my wake up or less than that yeah uh, that I went down. There was a lot of things coming to a head. <laughs> All at once. And, and when you say your wake um, up, can you just like give a nutshell kind of what happened? Yeah, I pretty much had like a, um, a surge of energy that came into my body from practicing meditation for months at a time. And it kind of had developed my energy signature, like kind of turned everything on. And I was having um, connections with 
the trees and the wind and doing stuff with clouds. And it was just kind of the beginning. And then I met Mike. So that was my kind of transition um, into this. So, so yeah, what happened was, is Ken finally, he, he contacts me and says, I want to come out there and book and train with you. Now, keep in mind, this was right during a transition period from when I was leaving a, uh, AEMI and creating Evolve Ministry. And so there was a separation thing that was happening between me and AEMI and the situation that happened between me and the person that runs AEMI. And there's no reason to even to get into that. But we'll just say that Ken also experienced some fallout as a result of what was going on between me and AEMI because the person who was... Uh, running AMI was also trying to get Ken and pull him into their particular organization. Well, anyway, Ken comes out and we had to kind of hash some things out there. A cool know. example of how people with matching frequencies show up together. Yeah. You know, you guys had matching energetic fields, so you were, it you were magnetically drawn to each other and following the path forward sure. together. Each one of us has a magical story of how we were brought together. I mean, there sure. was no, no just bumping into each other and saying, I see you, but it was just kind of like that. Absolutely. And so what happens is, is I take Ken out for a first night of training. Actually, it was probably a second night, wasn't it? It was the second night. That's right. And so we go out to the lake. Now, there's something that I do for every single student when they first come to train with me. Okay, number one, I find out if they're going to actually be a student, if they're going to stick with this for the long haul. Once they do, then I, pr I provide a thing of protection for them because it has to happen. If you're a teacher and you're a good teacher, you know what's going on out there. And so sometimes you have to do things to provide protection for your web. That particular night. For and let me just say, I've been to the lake with these guys, and it's really amazing. And um, also, 21st Century Superhuman, the book, is in the curriculum at Evolved Ministry, Evolved University. And um, when that's a whole other story about when we met, when yep. Ken, Ken met me and said, hey, I need to take you and, meet and introduce you to Mike. But anyway, go ahead, because it's a magical experience being at the lake with you guys. Yes, it is. And so <clears throat> I had forgotten to put my mode of protection around Ken. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Now, the thing is, the reason why it's dumb that I forgot to do this is that we actually do. Now, there's some people that get to see this and some people that don't, but Ken can 100% verify that it's true. I happen to have a group of what you would call negative, um, best way to put them is their agents. And they do show up and we're talking like in full men in black suits with black sunglasses at night. They do it. It's real. We've got and it on tape. As, as we regularly talk about, there's a reason those movies have come out, like The Matrix. and Exactly. Movie, because they are definitely relaying some stuff that's actually going on here. Absolutely. Those things are real. Yeah, I've had an experience, one experience with the Men in Black one time, too, when I was getting too deep into Bohemian Grove with a Rockefeller on Facebook. We were oh, yeah. having a conversation, and all of a sudden, it got really fucking weird. <laughs> that's what happens. And so, you know... I've had a long history with being with the black choppers. I've had a long history with the, the men in black and all that stuff. And I don't care anymore. I, you know, if I can give employment to some dude and he can feed his family for him following me around and doing a bunch of, that's fine. I don't care. So, you know, if he can take care of his family that way, who cares? Well, anyway, but these guys, they come in jacked with energy. Now, what happened was, is we're all out there and Ken asks me, and I'm not for sure what we were talking about to bring this up, but he goes, is there going to be any fear programming? Okay. And I told Ken immediately, well, no, I don't do anything in regards to fear programming because if I do anything in regards, I can teach you how to overcome fear. But if I start opening you up to those energies so you can overcoming, overcome them, then I'm really just sending them directly at you. Now, here's where things get weird. Okay. Ken asks this and opens it up. A whole bunch of vehicles, we watch them show up, okay? We watch them come in and around, and then they park right across from where we're at. Now, Ken asks about the fear programming. I say no. And after I finish my story with him, I turn around, and Ken's eyes have gone crossed. Now, Ken is now standing there, and he's wobbling like this. He's sitting there wobbling back and forth. Me and Daniel are looking at him, and then next thing that happens is Ken shoots up in the air at a 45-degree angle. 45 degree angle, shoots up into the air, hits a tree, falls from the tree, 
okay? Hits his head on the ground, and he is knocked out. We're talking out. He's twitching on the ground, okay? At this exact point, this very exact point, all of the cars turn on at once. The motorcycles turn on at once. Every single car that came in, they peel out that very second that he hits the ground, okay? Yeah, Which they, I were are, all, they were all motorcycles. They were Harley Davidson motorcycles. No. I, they were motorcycles for sure, but I, I sense they were Harleys because I could literally feel them in my body. It was wild. And there was a couple of cars that had come in with them too. But yes, there were definitely motorcycles there. And so now are we talking literally physical or etheric? No, oh, these are physical, physical motorcycles. Are physical physical okay. motorcycles. Okay. And so um the thing that was really amazing was the like I said, as soon as I had answered that question, it was the fear question. That was the only time that this had happened. And like I said, we watched this, we watched Ken's whole body, and he weighs what? How much do you weigh? Uh 165. 165 get thrown like a rag doll 10 feet into the air, hit a tree, hit the ground. And then what ends up happening at that point, there's a thing that uh, that I work with. They're called watchers. A lot of people may know what they are, but they always come in in, in animals. OK, and the big mass of blue heron flew in right at that second. And it starts squawking right at me. It lands right 10 feet from me and it's yelling at me. The thing is, is I can hear the transfer in my head. You forgot to put your protection on your boy. OK, and then I literally said out loud to him, I said, yes, I need you to put a tracer program on the people that just left. And the second that I did it, the blue heron flew up and went right towards the direction that those people were leaving. OK, so I got my tracer program on those guys and I ended up doing something later. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to even talk about that because it doesn't matter what occurred. We will just say that we found them and the situation got taken care of. But Ken learned a valuable lesson that night because the first thing that he asked about once we got out into that very magical place that Carrie was talking about, the first thing that he wanted to know about was there was there going to be fear programming. The minute that that came up, that was the opening that they needed to blast Ken. It didn't hit me. It didn't hit Daniel, and it nope. didn't hit uh, uh, Kyle. It hit nope. Ken and Ken only. Yeah, and I resonate. I see why I was resonating with that fear frequency of the story. I asked about the fear training or fear programming, and then he told a story of another student and about this thing that was manifested. And yes. I resonated in fear with that. The story was gripping, and I instantly it was like I manifested my own fear training because then the agent showed up and they projected energy and. I flew and all that stuff happened. They and blasted it, him. Oh, it was wild because when I was on the ground, it felt like my insides were liquefying. It just, it, it was so disturbing in my yes. stomach and the pressures. And I, I thought, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I literally had to come back to my senses as I can see those guys standing there talking like what's going on. And you know, the blue herring flies and I can see the motorcycles go across the bridge, across the lake. And yep. I'm laying there on my side and, I, I can't really get up and, you know, I start powering, I start moving my hands over my body and I start doing that. And I do that over and over and over. And instantly I turned that negative into, a into positive. the positive. And, and, and they remember I stood, I ended up standing up like all in, in, in like all of a sudden I was on the ground, you know, three, four minutes before. And then now I'm standing he was so, a bit wobbly, but he did get up really quick. And I did get up. <laughs> it, it was in, it was interesting. It was like, wow! I mean, I, it was a blast. What I, I thought we were going to have to take you to the hospital. We thought we we were like, oh god! It was like I can't believe I didn't. I forgot to put that it, protection over him. And like there was some protection that had to have happened from from like lo localized because I mean I flew so far in the air and I hit the tree like that far from my spine i have a huge scar on my yeah, back from it that was pretty nuts too and i hit my head like right here there was a huge rut i mean the way i landed it was i should have been paralyzed from it at least i tell you what with the way that you landed too is that something helped you out big time because the root that was up out of the ground if he had landed any other way if he had come down his head would have went into the root and the root was rock solid hard and it was as sharp as it comes and he would have just went right into it but he landed the exact way of course the universe wanted him to yeah. and 
to keep him nice and alive because that would have been a really rough situation. You know, it's interesting. These stories always sound kind of surreal when you first start hearing them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we talk a lot in 21st century superhuman about how there's different dimensions of reality. So we have the physical 3D dimension. Then we have 4D where there's this in-between worlds where kind of souls are figuring out where they're going and what they're doing and people are playing in darkness and people are playing in light. The dreamscape is there. And then when we start going into fifth, it takes our accelerated heart energies to get us up to fifth. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on in that fourth dimension, the transition from three to 5D, wouldn't you say, Mike, um, that mm-hmm. and, and, and you have a background in martial arts, right? And really strong one, yeah. Huge martial arts and even different kind, different types of fighting. Um, Absolutely. Really skilled artisan in these areas. And wouldn't you say that you use those things now in this dimensional um, field that you're operating in, you know, it's always a little surreal when we start hearing about it. And that's why I wanted to bring this up because the idea that we, we can operate in different dimensions, it's a huge leap to start opening up our minds and get that in our consciousness. For oh, sure. Uh, I don't think anybody's gone through this um, life without having had those experiences where if something was just a little bit off, it would have gone a whole other direction. I mean, they yeah. might have ignored it, but that's happened to them a thousand times in their lifetime. And those of us who have paid attention to it just get strengthened in our awareness because we're acknowledging the field, we're acknowledging what's going on um, and harmonizing with it. But I want to tell people who are listening to this story and are thinking, well, I don't know how to put a field of protection around myself, so I don't want to play with this stuff because that sounds scary. And I didn't know how to put a field of protection around myself the way that my Michael Grubb knows how to do it because I'm not in the kind of um, training situation that he's been through. But I can tell you when that happened to me, I didn't get tossed, but I had the whole internal liquefaction, just this is getting really fucking uncomfortable situation going on. And I had a choice point in that moment to either go deeper into fear or to step back into my power and realize that I was the one driving that ship and that there you go that was happening is because I allowed that thought of, uh Oh, something bad's going on in the first place. So you can just like surround yourself in a bubble of light. You can start focusing on things that you love. You can just even start saying the word love out loud. Um, <laughs> That's the most powerful power. word. Yeah. And, and it will literally disappear because that, that we live in a free will universe. They cannot fuck with you unless you let them. So if you're getting fucked with, it's your fault, not theirs. Well, exactly. And, the whole thing is, is they can only ride the wavelength that you're allowing them to ride. If they have anything to do with you, that means you open the doorway for them to be there. I've always said this. If you're a dishonest person, OK, if you're a negative person, you can't expect for the people who are around you or the entities that contact you to be any different because they're riding the same wavelength that you are just to be talking with you in the first place. You are right on. And that and we go over and over and over that, you know, if we're going to focus in negativity about someone else, the only reason that we have those focuses is because we're still carrying around old data inside ourselves. Yeah often from an unconscious level, Harvard studies say it's 95% of our energy, of our thought carried inside of us is unconscious. And it's based on thousands of generations. Um, Again, blame, fear, hostility, judgment, and control. And when those things are surfacing and we're playing in that energy, we are going to draw in other energies that match our frequency. It is the rules of the quantum universe that we live in. And like Braden says, the matrix can only give us what we give it. And That's so right. often we're feeding the matrix unconsciously. And so the 21st century superhuman journey is to kind of learn how do we begin deleting those things from our program? You know, the things that are outside of love, the blame, fear, hostility, judgment. And well, and, and even the conscious aspects of it that we're feeding, we need to be more diligent about because Absolutely. The, the catalyst for that whole experience was Mike going into a deeper story about a scary situation that he didn't get scared by because he knows his own power. But in that moment, Ken got drawn into a space. And so people are doing this all the time where they, they are. 
they're focusing on, you know, what Facebook can do to you and what this can do to you and what that can do to you. You know, they can see you through your TV and, you know, and, and I relate because I went through a period when I became aware of this stuff where I was like throwing blankets over my TV and like, and then I realized like, wait, what was different between now and when I was unconscious of all of this stuff and That's just... Right feel vulnerable whatsoever. Well, I wasn't thinking about it for one thing. I w- it wasn't even a factor in my world. Um, and so I'm going to go back to that space. Yeah, I'm aware of it, but I can choose whether it's going to be a factor or not. And I choose not to talk about it, not because I need protection, but because I don't want to give anybody else the space to fall into the honey trap because most people are go. aware of their power. There you go. And so that's, that's it right there. I think if people were to focus entirely on love, and that's the problem that we have in this particular reality that we have is that light, it accounts for both positive and negative polarity. And so we're all thrown in this space together. And given the fact that we're thrown into this space, sometimes we come across people who are either positive or negative, but really it boils down to you. It boils down to whether or not you're going to engage in the positivity or the negativity. And so you can say, oh, this person made me mad. Okay, but the fact of the matter is, it was your choice to get angry in the first place. Whether or not they made an action against you, you had a choice to do this or you had a choice to do that. And the thing is, is we all have that. Free will is the most powerful choice we've been given, the most powerful power. If there was any sort of power whatsoever, it's free will. You know, a lot of people ask me about uh, how do I cultivate uh, aerokinesis? How do I cultivate psychokinesis, this and that? And I always say it starts with will. There is no cultivation because you've already got it. There's no such thing as cultivation. It's there. What you have to do is you have to get the encrustment off of you that prevents you from being able to access or see your own connection. And that's the biggest problem is is that people are encrusted with all of their own vices. Yeah. Michael Rice calls it removing the corrupt data. And that's essentially what we need to focus on more than... Um, building your powers or getting enlightened or doing any of these things that people are trying to achieve, your, your mastery is your natural state. What you have to do is remove all the barriers that have been constructed. That's right. Recognizing it. That's right. So people are going about it mostly the wrong way where they're trying to build a skill. And, and yeah, it's, it is, you can exercise a muscle and it can be like that, but it happens a whole lot faster if you just focused on removing all the things that are not of source and not of your original divine blueprint. That's what we pretty much do as well with Evolve Ministries. We, the whole first chapter that you have to go through is all about the ego. Because the thing is, is I realized that in the place that I taught at before, they didn't teach anything whatsoever about the ego. They didn't teach anything whatsoever. They were just basically telling you, oh, cultivate your powers, cultivate your abilities. And I saw that as being a, well, Well, like you said, a honey trap because- they were teaching by example with the ego. I have to tell you, cause I watched. Some of it. <laughs> well, you, you saw the fallout, didn't you? You saw some of the fallout because I saw some of the fallout and it showed that the person who was teaching all of this stuff ended up falling victim of their own ego. They yeah. completely fell victim of their own ego. And the next thing that happened, well, you know, and yeah, I- it was like a star Wars movie. <laughs> You guys, why don't we go ahead and jump, <laughs> jump into the video of Mike and um, show people what telekinesis is and all these superpowers we're talking about. Should we do that a second and then um, come back and we can kind of go on talking about it? Let's give them a visual because it is such a cool clip. All and, right. Uh, yeah, let's, Mike is. Let's um, do it. Yep.
a human being can com accomplish just about anything. Anything. right guidance, right instruction, people who love you. Love the big thing. The word love carries a lot of weight when it truly means something, when it's something that is heartfelt from one person to another or one person to all, okay? When someone truly loves you and is willing to dedicate the time to help see you, uh, reach your fullest potential, that's when you know you found a good teacher. That's all I'm going to say about that. Evolve ministry is what it is. We are who we are. And our demonstrations are genuine every time. So we just watched Mike do some telekinesis. Um, Ken, do you want to talk a little bit about how telekinesis works? You know, moving the wind through the, and, and Mike has been, Mike and Evolved Ministry, which Ken is part of, and which 21st Century Superhuman is part of the curriculum of, um, are featured in an upcoming documentary. It will be new on Netflix pretty soon called American Jedi. So there's, you know, a lot of public, notice going on about these things these days and um i don't know ken do you want to explain a little bit about how sure, sure. Well, the video the video we watched was uh, a compilation video and uh, so i had psychokinesis now psychokinesis is just the term for all of the kinesis um and so basically moving, arrow, the wind, moving the wind through the tree basically moving the wind through, that's moving aerokinesis through, through, this aerokinesis right aerokinesis but psychokinesis, just like Ken said, is when you say psychokinesis, you mean telekinesis, aerokinesis, uh, atmokinesis. It's a general term for every kinesis that exists. Go ahead, Ken. No, yeah, you, you summed it up. So, I mean, that's exactly what it is. And so when you talk about telekinesis, you know, I consider that something where you're doing more indoor stuff. Um, we're either trying to move something in a sealed container or you have a side wheel on a pin, or you're trying to. Mm. Or with your mind, with the magnetics. Um, do you have one of those right there, Ken? Do what? Do you have one of those right there? No, I actually, I don't. I was okay. just, look, I was just looking. I, I don't have one. I actually just posted a, uh, a video of me doing an indoor telekinesis in a yeah he just concert. shared it so i'm gonna email him to biggie while y'all are talking so on sunday's show we can but, use that as our break video so if you're cool. curious as to what we're talking about with this tune in sunday night so mike do you want to tell us how you were moving the wind through the trees up on the hill there well that's a long process but basically you can think of it like this um Essentially, the mind, if you think of everything being frequencies, the mind operates on light. A synaptic charge, a neural synaptic charge, is nothing more than electricity passing from one neuron to the next, right? And so if everything works... Wow. Can we just let that settle in a minute? Can you just say that one more time? Because it's really good. I mean, we're talking all the time in 21st century superhuman about quantum physics, our understanding 
of this world operating in a way far beyond what has ever been understood in human history, except by maybe the shamans of different, you know, ancient cultures. And so mm -hmm. um, you are literally explaining this quantum experience of being in this physical dimension. So go ahead and say that. Can you kind of like repeat that? Because that was really sure. a great summary that you were saying there. Well, sure. Um, the world that we live in is made of light. Einstein threw that out there and gave us that little tidbit a long time ago, e equals mc squared, or e equals uh, mass times the speed the speed of light squared. <clears throat> and so that basically tells us that everything is made of frequencies and of light. Well, if everything is made of frequencies and of light, that means, and then we also have the double slit experiment, which tells us that light in of itself will change its behavior upon observation. So if light is sentient enough to change itself and change what it's doing upon just observing it, then that means everything here that this is composed of being composed of light it will change its behavior just by being observed now with that in mind thought is an amazing and most powerful thing because again it is a neural synaptic charge from cell to cell we communicate through electricity okay so it's an electrochemical uh, transmission that goes from cell to cell so the minute that you begin to think and i think i want wind to come out of these trees okay well all you have to do is just apply the idea that number one, I'm looking at the trees. So automatically I begin to change their behavior because they're woven of light. Then on top of changing that behavior because they're woven of light, then I have the neural synaptic charge, which tells me what my preference is. I would like to interact with these particular trees. So as that preference goes out there, the trees, of course, they're made of light. They received that electricity. They begin to buffer. What is known as buffering the same thing that happens as on your computer as soon as two energies collide what happens is is the energy in between starts to buffer it's an intermix between this particular object and this particular object so so when you say buffering yeah. it's like loading a video on your computer. that's right like that kind of yeah and out. this is something you can really you can really see when you walk around like you can notice in your own environment when you walk into an area maybe a new a new wooded area or a place of nature you can notice how everything will start to bring up you'll notice everything start to like just move even the breeze might come in real strong so Typically, yes. this can happen you can you can start to notice these things in your environment exactly and so if we take in account the idea that science has already accounted for the idea that light is sentient enough to change from particle to wave upon observation just by my looking at it or her looking at it or anyone, then that means that it is accounted for every single thing that will ever look at it in that moment. One thing that is really interesting, and Ken has seen this for himself as well, is on our videos, we can take and play our videos. And then all we have to do is play the videos, take the video outside, and everything that I'm doing on the video will happen outside with the trees. Okay, so again. Yeah, I've had that happen. I've played Ken's videos, like when he posts them on YouTube, and all of a sudden the wind starts blowing. Because a lot of times I'm outside in my van watching them, and I'm right under a big tree, and the oh, wind yeah. starts picking up. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, you, you, called, you called me one day, and you were yeah. like, you're like, I'm watching one of your videos and it's and it's all picking up. I'm like, yeah, that really does happen. Oh, I remember cool. you had some storm videos uh, uh, <laughs> that you had that you had to destroy. We had to destroy some videos. Because because these were, I mean, they would take it and turn that stuff on. So we had <laughs> what happened was is we made some videos. I had a video of where I was getting ready. It was a uh, two years ago and I wanted to go home. And when I say home, I mean, leave this reality. So I'm not going to tell you everything that occurred. It doesn't really matter. Um, but we ended up filming that scenario and it created a big, massive storm that night. When I say a massive storm, I'm talking like it was unlike anything that most people ever get to see, even during the most turbulent of hurricanes. That's the type of storm it was. Well, then we ended up by the next day. Okay. The next day, um, I decided, well, I want to see that film. You know, I didn't go home or anything, but I want to go ahead and see what happened and transpired. The very second that I turn on, when I hit play, a massive wall of wind hits my house. It sound, it's almost like a train that hits it the very second. Then as it's playing, everything that I'm doing, like for instance, if I'm um, making lightning occur, then the lightning starts occurring out there. Then all of a sudden, and it was unfortunate. This one particular one that we did have to destroy, it literally caused a tornado to come down the center of Bloomington on 2nd Street. 
It almost blew out uh, the entire roof of a school while kids were there. Okay. <laughs> and it had taken out four trees on second street took, um, destroyed all of these homes. I didn't even know this because I'm sitting there going, Oh, I want to see if this, this, you know, what's going on with the video. So then I call it Daniel Atlas and I'm sitting there still playing with this, even though I should have probably have shut it off. Who is part of your staff at Evolve Ministry? Who's part of my staff. Who's exactly. going to be on our show at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I call up Daniel and I say, okay, Daniel, where are you at right now? And he goes, well, I'm at home. And I said, okay, I'm about ready to hit play on my video. And as soon as I hit play on my video, I want you to tell me what happens at your location. So I hit play and then he starts screaming. He's like, what, what's going on? What's going on? And I was like, what do you mean? A transformer blew right at his house. The very second I hit play on the video. The next thing that happens, a massive tornado or tornado strength winds start to come in. And so he begs me to shut it off. So I hit I hit stop and I said, okay, now what's happening? And he goes, nothing. Everything is dead. Everything is dead silent. Same thing happened at my place. Okay. And so we did this five or six more times. And finally, Daniel was like, he's like, I think you should probably stop this because it's destroying everything. And I was like, okay. So then I go ahead and stop it. And then I, we end up finding out maybe about an hour or two later that all of this damage had happened downtown, that a tornado literally came through. And we knew that a tornado had come through, okay? Because um, there was a couple of things that happened um, off the side of that that we don't even need to go into. But um, long story short, just like Ken said, we ended up destroying that video because every single time we hit play on that, it created the same results. And these you know, are our words that do these things too. I mean, while you guys were talking about when the stuff outside my window is going off, but these things play out in our everyday lives all the time. And when you're powerful and you know you're powerful, they magnify. You so, got it. You know, walking around as a sheeple having a bad thought is not going to be necessarily as powerful as somebody who's awake and aware. So for all you awake and aware people who are spotlighting all the problems all the time, you're actually more dangerous than <laughs> than you know. Right on, Cammy. And you know, I've been with these guys when they've been stirring up storms, and each one will bring in different colors. And oh my God, I'm getting I've got like total goosebumps just talking about it. I can't always say you and your goosebumps, you know. <laughs> it's like we start talking about this energy stuff and I can feel the currents going through me. But here's the thing, you know, and and I will say what. I said when I first started being exposed to this, and I think the average person says when they start hearing about it, well, maybe you can do it, but not me, you know? And I think that's the common, it's the common like first, hi, Ken. I said, everybody can do it. Everybody can do it. And it, it but it is the common first response. Maybe you, but yeah. not me. But what Cammy's saying is so critical because the more awake we become, the more, I mean, the wind is blowing right outside my window right now too. So, I mean, the more awake we become, everything, every thought that comes through our mind, every, we are literally holding energy and form. And as Cammie said, when we're stuck in the collective, the old collective thought form, that's like an endless loop that we call, Ken calls it the AI, we call it the machine, we call it the robot kind of life where we're just getting up in the morning, going to a job we don't like, you know, so we can pay for the house and pay for the car and pay for the clothes so we can sleep in our house at night and get up in the morning and go to this non-creative life and we're living that robot-like life. We're not expanding the field at all, but when we start going into the 21st century superhuman quantum lifestyle and waking up to this amazing beingness that we are and realizing we can be awake, realizing we have an effect on the world around us. Um, yeah, we need, that is the walk of mastery in this world is to have the awareness of how we're applying our energy. But what's so beautiful is what you guys do with the wind through the trees and pyrokinesis and hydrokinesis and everything I've gotten to play with you with and learn how to do myself and I haven't been practicing enough, but um, but I love doing it. And um, it is really teaching me things about how I interface with this reality. So go ahead, Mike. Well, ultimately, what we do at Evolve Ministry is we're just teaching you common sense and teaching you how to take uh, responsibility for your own soul. Because exactly like uh, Cammie just said, you, this is the reason you got to understand that this is the reason why religions such as Christianity do exist is because what they're doing 
what this what the religion does is it goes okay instead of this person walking around and having uh, uh, responsibility for their own soul what we do is we take that away from them they don't have to worry about that anymore so all they have to do is believe in this and then it'll give them the same result as if they were to cultivate themselves well that is a big old lie okay no matter what you have to re be responsible for what's in your head you have to be responsible and know that if you're having negative thoughts those thoughts especially if you are um, Making if you're starting to evolve, you do have you have a responsibility to yourself and everyone around you to start really mastering your mind, mastering your soul, and to keep yourself in a love based position. Because if not, you throwing out even random, accidental negative thoughts could end up sabotaging people around you without you having any idea. And so the thing is, is what this is the reason why religions exist in the first place is. The system, and I'm talking about the people who created the system, okay, they knew how powerful mankind was, and this was their way of basically neutering us all, okay? It was their way of going, um, well, we know that if everyone has the ability to do this, then we have no control over them, but, but... If we make them to the point where they don't understand the responsibility for their own soul then we can corral all of their energy and then we can run this place. Okay. Because that's what they do is they corral all of that creative energy that would normally be cultivated by that person for that person. They take all the stuff that the people aren't cultivating. They hoard it for their own and they use that energy to create this reality and to so, recreate. Yeah. It. So right, Mike. And we, you know, we talk about the slave species mentality all the time on this show. So it's nothing new. I, I talk about it every day, everywhere I go, Ken, you are chuckling. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, when you talk about religion and how much it's based in control and the, I mean, what he just said was a, a perfect way of explaining what we're caught in is this. Per Interesting. <laughs> you have to repeat that, Ken. Repeat yeah, it again. You're totally frozen right now, but I have some comments on what, oh, here, there he is. You want to there finish? There he is. Repeat that. Repeat I'm, that, Ken. You got I'm stuck back. on control. You didn't even get control out. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's that's what that's what happens. Carrie is uh, looks like she's stuck too. Okay, um, <laughs> you're stuck in the control based reality where you're pretty much getting your energy sucked as a battery. Exactly. And so we're just trying to break you from your battery terminal. So, so you stop being used as a battery and become your own power source. Well, in the slippery slope, the slippery slope, all this is even when you're aware of the energy harvesting that's going on, even when you're aware of your creation uh, potential on a slight scale, we're so deep in the programming in this matrix and the collective. That's true. That it's still easy to get sucked into a story or get sucked into focusing on something. I mean, I know a lot of awake and aware people who understand these concepts and might not have um, studied them as in depth on the scientific side and on the experiential side as we have, but they understand energy harvesting and they understand how it works and they still get stuck focusing on the problem problem and it's not that you need to ignore what's going on it's mm -hmm. you need to approach it from a direction where you're not a tool for them because Precisely. they're they're using us in every way shape and form you can imagine and even the awake and aware community have become a huge toolbox for them to manifest things from. And so yeah. if you're even 51% more focused on the problem or 51% spinning every story as if the boogeyman's out to get you, you're a fucking tool. And people say, you know, why are we stuck? Why are we stuck in this movement forward? Why is it taking so long? Why isn't the funding coming through? Why aren't all these amazing projects going forward? It's us. It's our alignment with source. Are we aligning with the knowing that there is ever flowing creative abundance flowing through us. We got to get the spit wads off the lens of our movie projector. Basically, that's it. We are a movie projector for that source field of unconditional love. And as we begin removing our spit wads, it doesn't mean we we don't have we can't we can still say, hey, the collective has created you know 
kind of a negative field over there, like the boogeyman in the basement we were talking about earlier. So let's notice it and let's breathe, let's smile, let's align ourselves with love, let's start envisioning and seeing ourselves in the world as we're choosing it to call forth, you know, abundance flowing through, piles of money for, you know, humanitarian projects to change the course of where the civilization is going and, you know, support for every single person who's ready to be a light worker or a change agent on the planet. And, um, you know, these things are within us and it's our alignment with source. It's our alignment with the knowing that we are one with universal love. And it's, God, it's, it's, it's a shift. I mean, I talk about this every day, Cammie, I love your observations on it. They're just really perfect. And, um, well, and I get observations from everybody else's contributions. I mean, the reason we use the matrix as such a perfect metaphor for what's going on. And even, I mean, I, you go back and watch those movies as many times as you want, and you will pick up more and more based on your level of consciousness development. But it takes, you know, three episodes of that movie to get Neo, the one, it's an anagram, um, to recognize his power to the point where he absolutely refuses, puts his hands up and refuses to participate in the virus, which is Agent Smith. And then it gets to the point where he can actually transfer those skills in the matrix because he believes so deeply in the matrix that he can do these things, that he can transfer them outside of the matrix in his physical reality. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just the perfect metaphor, as is Star Wars, as is Avatar. Wow. As is things going on in Way. Hollywood right now. They are showing us it's, it's all breadcrumbs, people. It's Just true. You know, I didn't even realize until, like, I don't know, really recently that Neo was an anagram for one. I mean, yeah. And it's, I mean... <laughs> We're all, we're all Neos trying to learn how to just like not even participate. Just put your hand up. And we're not all there yet. I mean, I catch myself falling asleep occasionally too. And I'm like, wow, I just went into that story for about an hour. I can't believe yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, people can also check out the Animatrix. There, um, there's some good, good stuff in the Animatrix series. And it's, I believe, a nine-part series. It's one DVD, but it has like nine stories in it. It's and, much better too. Yeah, it gives a good background. It kind of, oh yeah, yeah, it's it's a real good watch. Mike turned me on to that. So there's so much crazy stuff coming out in Hollywood right now. I was telling Carrie and Ken about this movie Frequencies. I just uh, had all these synchronicities around attracting, um, and it was literally breaking down the matrix where people at different frequencies, when they come together, things would start falling out of the sky or, you know, plants would fall out if they couldn't stay together for more than a minute before the matrix started crumbling and trying to figure out how to manipulate these frequencies and what, um, you know, historically has happened in the Renaissance ages and the golden ages to harmonize people back into the same frequency instead of this person being of high frequency and being very lucky and this person being of low frequency and being very unlucky and that's i mean there's just so much stuff coming out right now it's so cool to watch all this unravel so we've kind of gone down a little side path here mike let's go back to you started talking you were explaining to us how it is you can move the wind through the trees you know and then we went into the extreme storms and all of that but let's come back to just the mechanics of how that works and how is it that you and Ken were able to activate in, that in yourselves and how it is that you teach that to us. Okay. So again, it's all, it's like I was saying before, it's a thought based universe, which is based upon electricity and everything will react accordingly. Um, so again, if we know that, that uh, the double slit experiment tells us that, uh, that light changes its behavior upon observation. Well, if it's changing its behavior, it's changing what it's doing, correct? Okay, and so that's the same thing. Once our minds begin to interact with the things that are around us, um, if we're in the universal mind, then it's always electricity that is transferring from one point to the next. And all it is is how that electricity flows. I eliminated a long time ago for myself a lot of uh, complex things because there's some people who... Uh, believe that they have to know every aspect of every last little thing. But in the end, all it is, is again, energy. Energy has a positive polarity or it has a negative polarity. It either flows freely or it doesn't flow at all or it's stagnant. And so what I did was I found 
the best ways to basically open up myself in order to get more harmonious universal frequencies in me. And it entailed getting all of the negative or the stuff that stops energy from flowing freely, which would be the negative aspects of myself out. So I started looking at all the things that are getting within the spit my- wads off the movie projector. There you go. So I decided to start looking at myself and go, what are the things that I have not learned from yet? What are the things in me that makes me a negative person or makes it to where others don't want to be around me? And then I had to look at myself and say, what is the ideal version of me and am I it? Once I started getting all of those negative aspects of myself out and started cleaning it all off, that is when energy started flowing freely as opposed to being stagnant. And so then I was able to just reach into the flow. Now, the thing is, when I'm teaching people face-to-face, Ken will tell you this, I can a lot for, I can account for whether you are going to be able to move energy or not. So basically what I will do is I will jack the environment to the point where even if you couldn't move energy before for yourself, in this particular space, you're going to be able to move it quite easily. And so the thing is, is you have to first put a person in a position where they see that they can do it for themselves, as opposed to looking at this person and going, oh my God, you're special because you've got this. So this is one of the reasons why Ken did this thing with you guys. When you guys showed up, instead of Ken sitting there and going, look at all the wonderful things I can do, the first thing that he did with you guys was show you guys that you could do it too, right? Am I correct? All right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And so that is the key to it all, as opposed to sit there and um, me give you a demonstration of how amazing and incredible I am, because to be quite honest, that's irrelevant. The most important thing a good teacher is going to do is show you right off the bat how amazing and incredible you are. And then from that point, we we turn that on, we tune it into it, tune tune into all the things that make you who you are. And one of the things that we also do is that we do a psychological thing to where we make you look at yourself. And this is also done through the curriculum. And then you eliminate all those negative things that are preventing the flow within your system. And that's what it all boils down to is flow, access. Okay. And so once you're able to get that access very freely and you see that you can do it, because that's anytime that a person watches a YouTube video, if they don't have, if they feel that they don't have that ability in themselves, they'll either look at it and two things will happen. They'll go, wow, that guy's amazing. Or that guy is a liar. Okay, because instead of it being an internal thing of them saying, I can do this or I can't do this, they're still pointing at the guy that they see doing it as opposed to looking internally to figure out whether or not it is within them as well. And that's what I tell everyone. There's nothing special here. This is the same robot that you're using, you're using, and everyone on this planet's using. Therefore, there can't be anything special about me if I'm in the same flesh and blood suit that you are. I just know how to use my technology. And so that's the thing is you teach people how to use the energy, their energetic system, and you teach them how to project it. And then once they get into that idea, it becomes, well, it's just like swimming. Right. And you're doing it from the heart too, which I think is a really critical aspect. I mean, you're empowering people back into, you know, their natural biological state, but um, you're making sure that there is a heart coherence coming along with it, which is really important because in this land of sheeple that we're living in, it would be really, really easy to get sucked into Darth Vader mode. Like, oh, I'm a powerful Jedi and look what I can do and don't mess with me or I'll cripple you kind of crap. And so, I mean, I think that aspect of it is what I love most about the work y'all are doing is that you start from you know just focusing on your heart and focusing on your frequency and everything else becomes like a byproduct of that absolutely um as a matter of fact i don't think it could have been actually said better than that so i would say excellent job with your wording and as you know like wording in of itself is you know i hate using this term because it's just such a dumb term but it's power if you know how to word things correctly and well just given the fact that everything is frequency. That's one thing that people on this planet have to remember. There's nothing that you do that is not frequency or electrically based. Nothing. Absolutely. And, you know, our thoughts, um, thoughts are what create and our thoughts are what are dictating our words. And as Michael Rice, who has is a really huge 
um, student of the ancient Aramaic who we had on the show a few weeks ago says you can literally change a civilization with its words and us understanding how powerful we are, our words are. I was just going to say about you guys demonstrating the one thing I love about just either being around either one of you and when we're all outside working together is I do get to model that with my neurobiology. I get to go, wow, you know, because I think what we're talking about here are things that people, you know, it's almost non-existent in our society, in the modern society, you know, very, very micro percentage of people get that we have these abilities to move energy, um, to move things with thought in the world. You know, we're understanding meditation and prayer, uh, but then to go beyond that and literally see the results right in front of us. I think it's such a huge demonstration of this, capability we have to literally move the world around us with our thought. And so the fun thing about you guys demonstrating and working with you, like I'd stand next to Ken, you know, for weeks on end, just practicing things so that I could kind of duplicate what he was doing with his physiology and his mental syntax. And I kind of absorb some of that. So I'd go, wow. Then I'd start seeing myself being able to do it because I was like, it's kind of like when we grow up and we learn how to walk and learn how to talk, we don't have somebody demonstrating this to us in our, in our world very much. So that's the benefit of Evolved Ministry, Evolved University. Go, Ken. Are you wow. going to say something? Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, but you can go ahead and finish what you were saying. That's all. I was just saying I love the examples. And, and I think that's the benefit of having Evolved Ministry and Evolved University because it gives – you know, a medium in which people can come and learn together and practice together. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to throw one thing in there and just add before you go, Ken, uh, is that a lot of people would ask, what's the whole point of even doing psychokinesis in the first place? Well, psychokinesis lets you know that everything is a part of you, that everything that you believe that is external, if you're able to interact with it, then that is a pure demonstration that you are actually intricately a part of it that you are molecularly and that you are on a cellular level a piece of it otherwise the interaction would not exist yes and this is a 21st century quantum experience in our world there's science behind it it is stepping up to the plate and interacting as an aware quantum 21st century superhuman, as we call it. Not only is there science behind it, but you say, you know, there's not any really evidence of it in the world or there hasn't been in the past, but it's really been there all along. It's just been sort of clouded in the distractions of, you know, the Bible does talk about love. It does talk about superhumanism. It talks about all these things. But when you get in, in a church and listen to the guy on the pulpit, he's not talking about any of that stuff. So you actually have to take your free will and study the religions of the world and not just the guy on the pulpit. Don't worship the false prophet. Um, the government has psyops programs where they fully unclassified will admit that they're doing these things. If you know a Navy SEAL or an Airborne Ranger or any of the special ops guys, they're getting training on these things. I mean, it's like it's out there. We're just not paying attention is what's really going on. So that's why we're going to start playing these videos and our breaks and our shows to help seed in the consciousness what's really possible because once that happens you can't unknow it exactly it's and what i was just gonna say and it's funny because you know i didn't even have to speak and carrie knew that i was wanted to say something just from the fact that we're together and we're connected like like we are in this close group that she just knew but i was gonna say it's such an amazing experience when you're out there and you finally like realize that you've made the connection and that it's you, that all this around you, and you actually discover that it is you, and it's movement, or you videotape yourself and you look back at the video and notice that every branch was moving just how your hands were moving, or how you were spinning, or whatever was happening. So it's an amazing, amazing experience to get out and connect, and it's so easy to go out. You can just go out and breathe. Just stand by a tree and take a deep breath. Just start breathing in and breathing out and notice what happens. 
notice if, if you start to connect, you'll notice that a connection will happen and it will start to raise the system and it will start to build just from your system. Absolutely. Alone, Absolutely. So, and just being amazing. out in the yard, in the garden, in the summer, in the yard, what do you do in the winter when there's snow out? It, when I, I, I go outside and practice. I mean, I was just outside yesterday for probably about 45 minutes in mid twenties, um, practicing. So, uh, yeah, you just get out and do it, you know, and I go to the water a lot. There's a lot of, um, icebergs now out into the water on Lake Michigan. So I'll hike out onto the icebergs and I'll play with the water out there on the icebergs. So there's, there's lots of good stuff to do. You just got to bundle up. That's it. Have they not seen the uh, snow tornado video that I yeah, did? Yeah, I've seen it, but that'd yeah. be good to show too, you know. Just I'll send it to you right now. Okay. That, that is a that is a very good uh, video. Yeah, and I'm without a camera right now. I've been doing everything on my phone. So I've been wanting to get some some good uh, snow shots because it's so, it's so, I guess you can really see the energy. It's almost like when I go to the beach and you get the sand movement and you can see the, the tiny particles of sand moving in the wind. It's that same type of flow. You can see the wind energy. You can see how it moves and flows um, really well when you can uh, see it in the snow or see it in the sand. And what's really cool, I think, is that you have to be of a certain frequency to attract people that are going to teach you about these things. Um, and so, you know, there's people that are worried about the collective getting a hold of this information. It's not going to happen like that. It won't happen all at once. You have to be ready when the student's ready, the teacher will appear kind of thing. Um, and so yeah. you know, for all of you that are listening and that attracted this show, good on you because you're doing something right. That's right. Let me, um, did you have something else, Ken, you wanted to say? No, no, I'm good. Um, so let's just take a couple of minutes and just talk about, um, we are all part of an organization that actually Ken and I founded called Global Leadership for Change. And we are connected with a number of people globally. And I think what one of the things that we want to offer is that there's so much going on. There's emerging communities around the world. There's people ready and starting projects that are for planetary change. And we are all involved in this at a level that is far more than just, um, you know, talking about some skills. Our lives are dedicated and committed. This is what we're doing with our lives. And we know many, many other people around the planet who are doing similar. So um, we're going to share with you a little video clip on Global Leadership for Change and some of our ideas and ideals, um, how we're focusing on moving forward and supporting the movement of humanitarian projects. Um, each of us, um, Mike Grubb, Evolved University, um, Ken with a women's shelter, um, Cami and I with various projects have literal proposals into global funding places. Um, and we are all moving ahead in our lives. And we want to encourage and inspire you to get connected, A, with your own abilities and B, with your own vision, heart and soul so that um, you begin taking steps in your life. We're, li we're really at a critical place on the planet right now. And um, we're at a critical place environmentally, humanitarian wise. We've got seven billion brilliant people on the planet who are, um, you know, I say there's seven billion geniuses here on the planet. All we need to do is exit this slave species system and be ready to move forward into living heart-centered lives. And what we're capable of doing is turning the course of some challenges that we have that are governmental, environmental, banking, religious, you know, all the challenges on the planet. So we're here to do that together. So grab a couple minutes of inspiration with this little video that we have. And we're close to putting a link up on our website with it. Not quite up yet at 21st Century Superhuman. Um, but we, wanna, we want you to think about joining us in this journey and committing your life to things that really matter for all of us as a human culture globally and for the children of the future.
wanna live my life. I know I wanna live it right. Sometimes you just gotta make a change. I got my soul right on. I got my soul right on. I got my soul right on, and it's grooving strong. I got my soul right on. Eternal's my soul life. Eternal's my soul life. Eternal's my soul life. It's burning bright. Eternal's my soul life. Bring the revolution! Reggae music coming, 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 coming from the soul. Sweet reggae music gonna come to your hole. Sweet reggae music coming, coming from the soul, from the soul to your hole. Reggae music gonna come from the soul. Sweet reggae music come, come to your hole. Sweet reggae music coming, coming from the soul, from the soul to your hole. Everybody come and ride the bus, get in, sit tight, hold on. You're gonna roll with us, we're gonna take you to another place. We get in and out of space. Wanna make you feel good, make you feel higher. We wanna light a fire to your soul when we roll. Get the big wheels turning, and you know that we be burning. So we'll say, Oh, 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 we're gonna stay. I wanna ride the bus today. Oh, 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 we're gonna stay. Hello there. So that is global leadership for change and give you a little vision of the kind of things going on on the planet, the need that we know is out there to encourage and inspire you to consider how you can participate, how you can begin making shifts into living more from your heart according to your true visions and dreams. And believe me, this is a dance, you know, it's a dance of mastery in this world as we begin making this choice. Ken, as we know, right? Um, We're all kind of in the midst of this and Cammy and Mike, um, we are all in it together. We're all here committed to our hearts, committed to the lives that we choose to live. And we deal with, you know, the challenges of making that shift in this world um, so that we're on um, an abundant path and something that can serve us and serve humanity. Um, But we encourage everybody to listen to their own hearts and intuition. And you can catch us at 21stCenturySuperhuman.com. And Cami and Ken are both available for personal consulting and coaching. Um, Mike does that um, through his work at Evolved Ministry. Uh, We have a blog post. We love the CCN network that we're on today. And we have blog posts on their website where you can catch more details on who we are and what we're doing and our other shows. So you guys want to give us some details on 
the practicality of what people can do in their lives to begin adopting these skills? What are some practices that people can do and begin turning themselves on to their own capability on a daily basis? Well, I guess uh, Ken and I, either of us could, could answer that. Um, Go ahead, Mike. There's so many, it's incredibly vast what you can do. Um, and for those who do want uh, greater access uh, towards teachings, we have so much stuff to offer. It's www.evolvedministry.com. Um, so if you want to go into the advanced training and believe me when I say there is plenty that you can learn in the advanced sections that are going to really, uh, accent your access. But, uh, now as far as home access and just practicing all by yourself, well, number one, my suggestion is always to get into the, uh, the act of meditation, of course. And a lot of people believe that they have to meditate on something. Not necessarily. Where I used to start was I would just repeat the word love over and over in my head as I was meditating. Now, when it comes to the practice of meditation, there's certain things like you want to practice breathing. You, and there's all sorts of different patterns that get all sorts of different effects. So what you're going for, that's entirely up to you. You're going to have to figure out what works for you. Um, another thing is humming. It's important that you really uh, work with vibration. And that's when you hum, you're working with pitch. Pitch is what? Frequency. Frequency affects everything that is around us, no matter what. If your frequency is going out, it layers into things. And so oftentimes what you'll see me do when I meditate is I'll do humming. What I'm doing when I hum is I tune my environment to my own specific frequency. That is okay. very cool. And you would put oming kind of in that category with humming. Sure. But, um, but that's really cool. And I, I know I get that working with both you and Ken, the buzzing or the humming. Um, and that's interesting that you're doing that in order to tune the environment to your signature. That's right. Yeah. And, and keep in mind that the environment can either accept your signature or it can reject your signature. Okay. So it has a choice just as much as you have a choice. So it is important that uh, if you do interact with your environment, that you are actually a genuinely loving person because believe me, your environment knows if you're trying to trick it, it really does. Okay. So the other thing is, is when you tune, you want to be in tune. Okay. So when you're humming and stuff, I would suggest, and you want to hum always to your own, what's most comfortable to you. I would suggest playing with notes and everything so you can see what different notes do according to your own biorhythms. But for the most part, um, what you're doing there is you're really tuning the environment to your own personal signature. And the more of your own personal signature that you get into the environment or that the environment accepts from you, the more the environment itself will be customized to your frequency and then you'll be able to get more out of it. So that's the thing that you want to really play with there. Ken also talks about when we teach together, um, when people are doing humming or buzzing, um, they're aligning, they're finding the tones that seem to go through the bones of their head to vibrate and activate their pineal gland. Do you want to Absolutely. talk about that a little bit, Ken? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, I mean, the toning and frequency, you can just, by, I guess, raising the pitch of the tone, you can kind of shift where the vibration is going to happen in your face. And you can move that actually to where you're getting a buzzing that's kind of around your head or even in your forehead um, and give you a sensation where your third eye is. But with the humming, you can literally, you know, we can buzz the pineal, we can come down and buzz the thyroid, we can move right down, do the thymus, we can use that same sort of buzzing or toning to activate each one of our glands. Um, so there's lots of awesome things you can do with uh, toning and um, harmonization is key and, in meditation and toning to help in the beginning get your mind to focus on that so that way your your monkey mind isn't kind of like focusing on everything else and it can kind of solely focus on that tone and as mike said harmonize and yeah that's really important and um and the other thing mike was sharing about the breath and then focusing on like the word love you know emptying the mind um 
and I've been practicing as we've been talking about with the Heart Math Institute um, monitor, which is this little biofeedback device that um, kind of looks like this, and you have the lights go on. You clip it to your ear or your put your finger on it, and it will give you feedback. You want to be in green or blue. It's amazing. Um, and I've been playing with it to discover, you know, when I get into too much thought, it goes red. And so the places I find in my meditation that I can keep it green are when the mind is empty or I'm giving myself to the source field to pure love. I'm going out of form into the field. And, um, you know, every person can play with it and find out. And then I use it when I'm active sometimes too, like if I'm working on the computer or I'm doing yoga and see when, what states I'm in to, and it's really a nice piece. I think every person ought to have one of these and you can now download an app onto your phone and you can order from them for about 99 bucks. The Heart Math Institute, um, I'll find them online. You can order um, the little cord that would go from your ear to the phone. So, um, and that gives the biofeedback that it, basically what it's reading is, the space between heartbeats. And I find in order to get it really to turn green, I have to like open up the top of my head amazingly. Like I have to like let these bones up here relax because when, and if you think of the thousand petal lotus being the seventh chakra, you know, the opening to the higher chakras, um, this is like a, it's really interesting to feel that with the feedback of the mechanism. Um, so going into love, going into the source field, um, just this really simple emptying. And the second I go into thought, it goes back to blue and in too much thought, it goes into red. And so it's about coming out of that. I have to push and make this world happen instead of I'm going into the flow of the divine one. And I think in a way there's a feminine energy to this. I think it's the feminine and masculine that are coming together that we're going to be talking about next week on this show. But coming together within us, so we're finding this balancing of energies of receptive and flowing um, to really learn how to operate as creators in this world. Anyway, go ahead, Mike. Those are my kind of two bits worth here. Well, that's that's actually, you know, an extremely good addition to all of it, really. Um, but, yeah, there's also many tools that you can uh, – and it's interesting because when it comes to psychokinesis, the more creative you are, you're going to find uh, with your own tools, the more you're going to really send yourself through the roof and being able to do all this stuff. So, for instance, like make yourself a side wheel. Side wheels are very easy to make. All you have to do is take a piece of paper, you fold it up, take a pen, attach it to it, and then you play with it. And given the fact that you put the energy into making the side wheel in the first place, that is creation is something which is absolutely one of the most imperative things to do on this planet. If you, even if you choose not to work with psychokinesis or anything of the variety, I would suggest doing any form of creation that you can find, whether it be drawing, painting, crocheting, I don't care what it is, exercise that creative portion of yourself because that's what you really are. You are a creator at in the heart and soul. And so the more you create your own tools, okay, of which to interact with, the more effects you're going to get out of them. So like a side wheel. Um, now, another thing that you can purchase, which is they're called pinwheels. You can get those online. Um, uh, Ken has a particular place in which uh, he recommends to get pinwheels from. I'll let him talk about that here in a few. But I think that those pinwheels are the best pinwheels I've ever bought. You know I bought what? I have mine. I'll run and get it. But is this kind of what you're talking about, Mike? I just took this yeah. um, piece of paper and folded it. I just cut it so it's, you know, just a little square. Sure. And then I'm going to take it and sit it on a pen. Is this yeah. kind of what you're talking about? That's that's basically what it, what a side and, wheel is. And then so you then you want to focus on it and get it to move, right? That's, that's the whole key to it. And so... Um, and you, so I'll, you go ahead and keep talking and I'll run and get my pinwheel. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. And okay. So you can also use uh, pinwheels, just like I was saying, and pinwheels are extremely good to use. They're one of the best dialing tools I've ever used. Uh, 
when it comes to working with uh, energy outside. Now you can actually play with pinwheels inside too, but that's a whole different animal. You know, that's telekinesis versus aerokinesis. Okay, so, but when you're outside and you have a pinwheel, um, and there, those are those miniature uh, windmills just for people. They're like garden windmills. Um, but I tell you what, you can get extremely detailed with those and they cost anywhere between what, $5 to $35 to $45 to get a relatively decent one that you can work with. Pretty inexpensive and the fun lasts forever. I'm sure Ken would 100% agree with that. Um, so there's so many different ways that you can sit and play with things by yourself. You can even just grab a lighter or a pen or a pencil and just try to rotate them or move them. And right there is a perfect example of the pinwheels that I'm talking about. Um, I think the place that we get those is called Makite, M-A-C-K-I-T-E. And these are these, uh, I'm not even for sure what those are called. Ken, jump in here because I'm not even for sure what that's called. Um, well, you have the, the pinwheel and then you have the windsock. And that's a, it's a uh, I think it's called like the triple spinner, triple spinner windsock by Matt Kite. And uh, yeah, it's a company based out of Grand Haven, Michigan. So you can use it. Uh, usually on my wall, I'll post something once in a while. I haven't done it in a while with their company. But yeah, for like Mike said, about 35, I think that one was um, the sock was 25 or 29 and the um, pinwheel was like 34 something, 34.99. So, and, and they're are, directional tools. And yeah, the directional is key too, because you want to want to mess with the direction as well. You have each one of those three spinning things that you can alter the which way they're going, the speed, stop and start. Um, really, really effective, as Mike said, in dialing in your energy and honing your aim. Because when you first start out, your energy is chaotic. So in the beginning, it's all about rendering your energy and like you know getting rid of all the chaotic energy you got going on because you're shooting it everywhere and you can learn to focus your energy in on this and dial in where you want the ambient because really in the beginning you're just connecting with the ambient energy and learning how to locate and direct it and that, that's all it is you're not you're not making this up making this the energy is there and you're just directing and connecting with the ambient energy so this helps you dial that in and then, you know, we go up from steps from there, which is engineering, which is quite wild. <laughs> it's quite so a bit we'll different. We'll start posting some videos of that in, in between our shows. Oh, that would be good because it would be great that people get to see how uh, the interaction between people and the pinwheels work. And again, there's the, not only do you have the three rungs that you can play with on the pinwheel, which allows you to really get specific, but you can also, there's a flag on the back of those pinwheels that you can use to literally take it from one direction to the next. And so that teaches you how to uh, uh, direct the literal direction of the wind. You know, the wind will oftentimes, it, it, it's a pretty cool little element and it'll let you work with its directionality, its speed, and you just have to be responsible. And you have to be the type of person, like I said, the, the environment knows whether you're a loving person or whether you're something else. And so it will make that it. That is so really it. true. Yeah, I, mean, I love that. I mean, Carrie, I, Carrie was even saying earlier how, um, well, you know, we need to have the training or, you know, well, the universe kind of has its own governance system. As Mike was saying, it's like if you have, you know, negative things going on or if you are like in that alignment, it, it knows. I mean, it can see right through you. We can see your energy signature. You can see what your color you are and what your frequency is. And, oh, it won't, it won't share its energy if you're not in alignment with it. It will not participate. And let's I mean, say, I've seen it shut completely off when yeah. someone else came into the mix where it was like gone. I mean, you'll notice from videos where people will walk by in our videos and you'll notice it will instantly change when this person, these people will come out of nowhere and then they'll just walk by and the system will all calm down. And then as soon as they go by and you put your hand up, all right back in. And let's say everyone is capable of being in loving energy. So all this is, it's a biofeedback, it's another biofeedback system to tell us to clear more, to align more with love, to breathe and smile. It's amazing. It's an amazing mechanism that can teach us how 
you know, how aligned we are to get a response from our world. It's really, really super cool. And um, just as anything in life is, the second we feel pain, it is the matrix mirroring to us and, and old energy we have inside of us that needs to go. So the second we feel pain, fear, sadness, you know, judgment, hostility or control, when we feel anything like that come up, it's this little point that is saying, hello, still some energies in here. And really, this is just data that has to be cleaned out of our biocomputer. And we talk about that a lot in the 21st century superhuman process. And the same thing with doing all of these cool physical response activities with the environment. It just is showing us open up more to your alignment with your heart and with love in order to get this amazing response. Um, Absolutely. It, it's like a, the most perfect profiling system I've ever, ever, ever seen or witnessed. Yeah. It makes Google look weak. And Google's pretty, <laughs> pretty good yeah. profiling system. It, it has pretty good predictive measures. I will say this. The system that you're in, whether people want to believe it or not, because a lot of people are like, oh, I hate this world or I love this. You know, it is a perfectly designed system of which caters to your own preferences and your choices that you make. You make positive choices, it throws positivity to you. You make negative choices, it throws negativity. And it also balances everything out accordingly. And it's not only balancing for you, it's balancing for 7 billion other people, every ant that's on the ground, every single chipmunk that's out there, it balances for all of these thoughts. And that whole concept that we are all connected, we literally are one. One. Uh, and again, I'll repeat um, uh, something that is in the book, 21st Century Superhuman. It's from a quantum physicist, and it's a concept. You Imagine the river flowing. It's kind of like Rumi says, you are the drop and you are the ocean. But if we imagine a river flowing, and the river has eddies and currents, and we each are in the river, we're part of the river, so the river is the source field flowing, but we're like a little eddy. We're focused in on ourself and our life and our ideas and our expression, you know, and there's a whole bunch of other little eddies in the river, and the more we open up to love and to this pure divine being that we are, we end up flowing in that river um, more openly and more integrated with the rest of the whole field, but that's how we're one and how we're, it's kind of a neat way to, to picture it. We're all little eddies in that same river of source. And so if you get too focused upon yourself and you're, you're just self-serving, then you're never going to experience that wonder of being connected into that massive flowing river that allows you to like experience the most beautiful ebbs and flows and turns and changes. Otherwise, you'll just sit there and you're all curled in by yourself and you're just self-serving all the time. And yeah, so we wouldn't say we wouldn't say never, but <laughs> it's yeah. it's the wake it's the wake up call. I mean, this field that we live in sure. is the response mechanism telling us either we're aligned with love or we need to get more aligned. Absolutely. I and I think that it's pretty much one or the other. You know, there's definitely a world of gray that we have out there and we can throw in so many things in front of us that we want. But again, like I said, I simplified things for myself a long time ago. It's either I'm in the flow or I'm stagnated. Right. End of story. And so. And your navigation system is simply how you feel. You follow the feeling of bliss or you follow the feeling of feeling terrible and some people feed off of that feed they do terrible cortisol is the strongest addiction on the planet the stress hormone is the strongest addiction on the planet and some people don't know how to live their life um, or function without it and so you know a big obstacle in getting out of your own way is to start recognizing What's driving you? Is it a conscious thing? Is it an unconscious thing? Um, and until you get control of your monkey mind or beta mind, um, 
you have to start picking and choosing your thoughts carefully. And that can be daunting at first, but it's as simple as just stepping back, becoming the observer, just like you're in a movie, watching a movie, like, oh, look at these thoughts that are running through my head. That's really interesting. And start picking the ones to play with. So just like you would pick who to play with in a bar or a playground or wherever you go to play, you need to start doing that with yourself and start recognizing um, where you're sabotaging yourself and where you're feeding yourself and where you're feeding yourself from. Is it from the soul or is it from the ego? And it sounds really complicated, but if you can just focus on the feeling and what feels good and what doesn't feel good, and eventually you'll get into a space where you're feeling so good all the time that when the not feel good stuff comes out, it sticks out like a sore thumb um, it's like the, uh, the thorn in the lion's paw, it starts festering and it becomes even easier to clean up at that point in time. It's um, obvious. Yeah. But everybody wants to feel good. So if you think you're going to accomplish that by, you know, buying a new car or buying a new dress or, you know, whatever, um, we're talking about a permanent solution here, not a temporary one. So yeah, you know, stop, uh, stop feeding your ego. Yeah. Your, your stress is feeding your ego. <laughs> yeah, and this, meaningless, this meaningless living. I mean, and we're all guilty of it. We all got sucked into mm -hmm. this trap. I mean, we're not standing here from a point of judgment We're we're trying to, um, you know, show you the way out because we had to do it ourselves. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking to fill that void inside yourself, that's causing you to, you know, chase the stress or chase the sex or chase the drugs or chase the whatever, um, it's meaninglessness. That's what you're trying to fill. And so, you know, part of why we showed you the global leadership for change video and asking you to get involved is because it's a simple choice point. You either choose to keep feeding that empty bottomless pit of an abysmal existence mm -hmm. or start feeding something that matters and that your soul is going to get on board with because when your soul gets on board and you get connected to that that's an that's the best high on the planet that's a natural drug it's a natural motivator it's inspiring it's passionate it's what you felt like as a child before you got the literal life force beat out of you either emotionally or you know hopefully not physically but that happened too if you were emotionally resistant <laughs> to it well <laughs> there, and you got to recognize you really people out there have to recognize when they're feeding into it. There's certain people who will only talk to me or this used to be, this was a while ago, but there's, I think we all have people like this. Actually, there are certain people who will only talk to you when things are going bad for you. Oh, yeah. people, you know, if you, the minute you say, Oh man, things are going great. I've, I've had this happen and blah, blah, blah. They're off the phone. They're off the phone with you in the next 30 seconds. But if you have some sort of tragedy or you have something to say about someone else, that's when this person is willing to listen to you for the next three or four hours. They're willing to hear everything yeah. negative that you have to say. And you have to realize when you're participating in it and when you're feeding someone else it and then when you're being fed it yourself. Yeah, that's not compassion. We've we've gotten confused about what compassion and empathy are and what boundaries are and what you know, we call it psychic vampirism. And there again, right. we're all speaking from experience here. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's happened to everybody. Some of us got sucked in a little deeper than others, but we all went through it. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a whole new way of living. It's not just a diet. It's a full on lifestyle adjustment and you have to put yourself first there for a little while. And the people around you are going to start dropping off. Oh yeah. Confused about what's going on and why all of a sudden you don't want to play in those energies anymore. And why you're getting real short with these stories that they want to tell you, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, Oh, I just realized I got to go. Like it's, it's like that. So I would say yes, yes, and more yes. I mean, great overview, Cammy. I mean, we really, it is a big step to, you know, take the wake up steps in our lives and to begin meditating, to begin doing practices, to begin choosing friends and a way of thinking and a way of living, eating, sleeping that, that really calls in our soul. And then, you know, and then changing our life path based on that. I mean, how powerful is that? We're living at this amazing time 
or the crises on the planet are kind of calling us saying, you know, what are your, you know, let your great, great grandchildren or the children of the future speak to you. You know, if you don't have kids, let the children of the future speak to you and say, you know, what did you do with your life when you saw that the world was in crisis? Did you, did you make a choice to step into who you truly were and to connect with your own ability to move this world as a quantum being as you began to wake up to it? And what do your great, great grandparents or your ancestors say to you that says, go forward, you know, and thrive. Yeah. I mean, silent consent is how the Holocaust happened and knowing about something and not doing something about it is the exact same thing as not knowing about it, except <laughs> you can't convince yourself that you're ignorant anymore. So you're really going to feel bad. And once you <laughs> listen to us, you're going to know about it. <laughs> and, and people always want to say, okay, what can I affect in the external? You know, I'm seeing these things going on and I want to affect this world and I want to make a change. Well, you don't do it by external. You do it by internally, by self-mastery, by working on yourself and changing your vibration. And once you change your vibration, then you're going to effectively change the world through the collective. Yes. Because what we're doing is we're raising the whole vibration. So <laughs> it's not like you, you know, you can start out in your daily life by doing a good deed to say, you know, what did I do? that was nice for someone today or how did I treat someone as I would treat myself? And you can start right there. And that's how you can effectively start to change and start to change yourself and the vibration you're vibrating at. And you will see the environment change around of you effectively changing the world. Yep. It's, it's a uh, be being a programmer, not the programmed as we nice. always say. Yeah. And as we do that, we begin to be able to hear our own heart again, you know, which yeah. is for many has been shut down in this culture, in the, in the AI, in the automatic system, in the robotic kind of culture that we're living in. Even taking a small step in that direction, your soul is so waiting for you to just take the smallest little step in that direction that it will pick you up and carry you like a tsunami. Um, you just have to, it's baby steps. Just start, mm. you don't have to master your mind overnight. You don't have to get it all sorted out quickly. You just have to, when you notice it, in the moment that you notice it, make that choice, pivot, you know, rewrite, imprint, choose a thought, choose a action, choose, you know, a focus that is serving you and everything will just fall into place. The flow will find you. And as we do so, we draw new people into our field, people that are our posse, our tribe, our compadres, those who are aligned with our soul essence and our soul energy. And that is really exciting and fun. It is because you don't have to work at anything anymore. It just it happens like magic. All you have to do is focus on your frequency and everything just finds you. It's like it's the most remarkable way to live you can, for a type A overachieving personality i can't tell you how refreshing it is just to be able to lay around and be like i can't wait for that to show up all i gotta do is ask for it put it out there and just align that's it that's all i gotta do mike you have a couple of closing thoughts for the well soul journey sure my closing thoughts is that the space of love is a lot easier than we we typically think it is and i've heard a lot of people in for some reason, love seems to be one of the most elusive things because everyone typically relates it to the romantic sort of thing. When I say the word love to most people, they're thinking in terms of romance. It's like, no, 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 no. Wait, do you love your mother in a romantic way? Absolutely not. The way you love your mother is the way you should love every single human being on this planet. And it's a lot easier. All you have to do is practice it and understand the idea that you would want. For me personally, it was very easy to say, I want to give out the same love that I would expect someone to give to me. Okay. I don't want to be treated neg negatively. I don't want to uh, think negative thoughts about anyone else. Therefore, if this is the case, then maybe I should turn around and make my own behaviors conducive in a way that I treat people in the way that I know that I would expect to be treated. It's a very easy thing. And evolution, your soul evolution is also equally as easy. You can put a lot of things ahead of you and make it as hard as you want. You can make it as complex as you want. You can go the religion path and sit there and tw twirl yourself in circles. But in the end, even Jesus stated it's a thing where you have to do it yourself. You have to bring yourself to the Father if there was ever such a thing 
and then love everyone equally. That was his biggest thing was to say that love is what's going to heal us all and connect us into these things that make us superhuman. If the dude was walking on water, if the dude was actually changing water into wine and doing all this other stuff, yet his biggest thing that he was talking about was love, then it would be very simple to me to go, well, I think the reason why he was able to do all those things is because he was actually living the creed of love. Mike, thank you so much. And we love hearing this from a man. <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> and we'll see you on our show next week and our Sunday night 21st century superhuman show. All righty. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for love coming. You. See you soon. Love you too. Lots of Take love, care. everybody.